Welcome to the Who, What, Why podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Sheckman. One of our most distinguished journalists once told me that the key to writing or understanding any story is first and foremost, go there. In this time of confusion and debate about facts, writers also need to reach into our history of full-throated, muscular, participatory journalism, the kind practiced by the likes of George Plimpton, Truman Capote, Hunter Thompson, and David Foster Wallace. This is exactly what my guest Georgetown University professor Rosa Brooks did, except it wasn't really her plan. She was working at the Pentagon when she heard about the D.C. Metropolitan Police Corps program. Intrigued at first, suddenly she had a badge, a gun, and a uniform, and a whole lot of academic ideas about cops, criminal justice, law enforcement, and what it means to protect and to serve. Suddenly she was over and inside the blue wall. It was as if she was going into another country. She had to learn a new culture, a new language, new attitudes, and even her family feared not only for her safety, but that she would somehow go native on the journey. We're going to talk about all of this today with Rosa Brooks. She's currently a law professor at Georgetown University and founder of Georgetown's Innovative Policing Program. She has worked previously at the Defense Department, the State Department, and for several international human rights organizations. Her new book about her experiences with the Metropolitan D.C. Police is entitled Tangled Up in Blue, Policing the American City. It is my pleasure to welcome Rosa Brooks here to the Who, What, Why podcast. Rosa, thanks so much for joining us. Jeff, thanks for having me on. Well, it's great to have you here. First of all, let's begin by telling our listeners a little bit about how you came to this this position with the D.C. Metropolitan Police Corps. <laughs> Insanity, or at least that's what my, my family and my colleagues and friends all told me, um, a moment of, of total insanity. You know, um, I've always been fascinated uh, as an academic, as a, as a writer, as a journalist, human rights advocate by the relationship between law and violence. And I've, I've worked over the course of my career in places ranging from you know, Kosovo and Iraq and Sierra Leone and Afghanistan. And, and I've always just been really fascinated by the way different groups talk about violence, their own, the violence of others, and, and how they try to tell stories to make sense of their own roles and other people's roles. And so when I discovered that the D.C. police had this fantastically crazy program, um, and it is a crazy program. You can volunteer and apply to the D.C. police department, and, and if you're accepted, you go through the police academy, same training as, as regular full-time cops, and you come out as a sworn, armed, unpaid officer. And I thought, whoa, you know, you'd give a law professor a gun? Are you nuts? Um, <laughs> but but when I, as soon as I heard about this program, I thought, wow, that would be so fascinating to go into this world that often seems so closed and so opaque to outsiders and get a chance to see how police officers themselves make sense of their role in their world, what stories they tell themselves and others. Did you see this as an exercise in something that, that you knew you wanted to write about and understand in a participatory journalism kind of way, or something that you thought would, would give you greater insight into the work you do as a law professor? You know, more the former than the than uh, more the latter than the former. Uh, I didn't know what I was going to do with this. Uh, you know, it just seemed fascinating to me, and maybe I'd read too many detective novels or something. But um, you know, it seemed fascinating. I I was sure it would somehow be grist for the mill, but I didn't really know how. And it was only when I was about a year into it that I started thinking, you know, maybe I should write about this. Uh, maybe that's one of the things that should come out of this. And and the two big things that did come out of it, one was the book uh, that we're talking about today, Tangled Up in Blue, and the other was a, a program I started uh, at Georgetown um, called the Innovative Policing Program. But when I went into it, I didn't know that either of those things would come out of it. I want to come back to something you said a few moments ago in terms of the violence that's inherent in policing today, particularly in our cities, and that the idea of, of to protect and to serve has really morphed into much more of a violent exercise. Well, you know, that's, that's both profoundly true and, and also sort of misleading. It's profoundly true in the sense that, that American police kill about a thousand people a year. 
um, which is quite stunning when you compare American policing to policing in other countries, uh, for instance, or European countries. Um, you know, in, in the UK, most police officers aren't even armed. Um, and so on the one hand, yes, it's this breathtaking level of violence. Um, on the other hand, in terms of the experience of the, the average officer, the overwhelming majority of police officers will go their entire careers never even pointing their weapons at someone, much less using them against anyone. Um, and trying to kind of unpack that seeming contradiction where we, we both have this incredibly high level of violence compared to policing elsewhere, you know, lethal violence, you know, about a thousand dead people a year killed by police in the United States with the fact that almost all police officers almost all the time are not using lethal force or even for that matter, any force uh, that they're, they're doing a whole lot of stuff that is frankly much more mundane. Given that, how much does the violent aspect of it infuse the culture because the danger is certainly there all the time to what degree is it part of police culture and what did you come to understand about that it's very much part of police culture and you know it, it's part of how police define themselves they define themselves as uh we have a dangerous job we run towards the sound of gunfire when everybody else is running away and that's true uh, it is a dangerous job, and, and cops do constantly and willingly put themselves into incredibly fraught situations, which can become violent. You know, even, you know, you go to a domestic violence call, uh, you know, and a, a, a partners are fighting, and you're physically putting your body in between them sometimes. And um, it, it's such a huge part of how cops think of themselves, and, but it's also a really distorting part. You know, one of the things that, that struck me when I was a recruit at the D.C. Police Academy was how much the sort of unofficial lesson of the academy was anybody could kill you at any time. We were constantly watching these videos of police officers getting killed. You know, they'd, they'd do a traffic stop and somebody would jump out of the car and shoot them. And they'd go to a domestic violence call and the door would open and somebody would come out and shoot them. And we would be asked by our instructors to, to analyze these and talk about you know, what could they have done differently? How could they have approached the scene differently so they wouldn't get killed? Um, and constantly told, you know, there's no such thing as a routine call. Any, any encounter could turn lethal in a millisecond. You always have to be vigilant. And that's, you know, again, that's both absolutely true, but it really distorts how officers think about their work and respond. Because policing is dangerous, but it is not nearly as dangerous as people think. In fact, only a, a relatively small number of police officers are killed on the job each year. It's a, you're more likely to be murdered on the job if you're a taxi driver than a cop, for instance, about twice as likely to be murdered. But nobody says, my God, we've got to arm taxi drivers and, you know, train them to shoot first and ask questions later. If, you, if you're a cop and you've had it drilled into you from your first day in the police academy, that anyone you meet could pose a lethal threat, you start seeing everybody you meet as potentially a lethal threat. And some cops inevitably are going to shoot first and ask questions later. And that's part of the reason we end up with a big pile of dead bodies at the end of every year. Is that cognitive dissonance that's at the heart of this, this sense of danger, this sense of being trained in precisely the way you're talking about it, is it does it make it impossible to try and create a any different kind of culture within police work? No, I don't think it does at all. And and you know, I think one of the the hardest kinds of conversations I've had with with police officers is when I say, you know what, guys, um, we're always congratulating ourselves on on running towards gunfire and how we do this dangerous job. It's not as dangerous as you think. People really don't like hearing that because, you know, we want to think of ourselves as brave. And, and it feels like people are saying when they say that, like, oh, you're not as tough as you think you are. You're not as brave. Um, but, but I think when, when cops then, when you start having those more serious conversations about how much of what police are trained to do and primed to do is focusing on the hypothetical one time out of 10,000 that somebody is going to be trying to kill you. And that's at the expense of the, you know, 9,999 times 
that the person you encounter, even if you're arresting them, even if they're a violent criminal, is not going to be trying to hurt you. And it means that you, you know, you're not investing enough time in de-escalation skills, in, in learning how tactically to give, to slow things down, to give everybody the time, the space, the distance to calm down and make decisions in a relaxed way rather than an adrenaline fueled way. And once you get cops to have those conversations, you actually, I think a lot of officers start, start agreeing, you know, that, that nobody likes feeling like they're scared all the time. And when you can say that, you know, you don't have to be scared all the time. Um, and in fact, if you're not scared all the time, because you realize most people aren't trying to kill you, it opens up a whole range of other options for how you interact. Is there a nexus? I mean, you worked at the Pentagon for a while. Is there a nexus between police training and attitude and military training and attitude? And if there is, is that a good or a bad thing? Mm, that's a complicated question. Um, you know, and, and, and I, one of the things that drove my interest in this is, is I had written about uh, previously about how uh, in many parts of the world, American war fighting looks a lot like urban policing. And I was interested in the ways in which increasingly in this country, policing can look like war fighting. So looking at that kind of blurring and merging of these, these roles is part of what I was really interested in doing. But I think it's, it's you know, the military itself is not homogeneous. Um, the experience, you know, of being a naval intelligence officer or an Air Force pilot is really different than being a you know, Marine Corps grunt or an army mechanic who fixes vehicles at the base. Um, and there's, you know, there's been a lot of talk in the U.S. about the militarization of policing. Most of that has focused on these very surface things like, you know, rural police departments that think they need Humvees and assault weapons. Um, um, but, but I think that, you know, the, the, if you get, if you think about military culture, military training, military doctrine, there are both terrible things that have been imported by police from the military into policing. And frankly, there are some things that policing would probably improve a great deal if they imported from the military. Um, so, so I actually think it's a, it's, a, it's a more complicated issue than people often realize because we focus so narrowly on the, you know, the, the, the cops with Humvees as opposed to thinking of militarization and all these other dimensions. Which really goes to this issue of, of how police departments and police are perceived today in that, you know, a large percentage of the people think cities are over-policed and an equally large percentage think that they're under-policed. Talk about that from the point of view of, of what you hear from police officers themselves. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think, and they're both right. Mm. You know, uh, American cities are simultaneously under and over-policed. Um, and I think that, you know, cops certainly feel often often I think cops are very defensive about that. They, they say, you know, people say we're an occupying force in these poor communities and communities of color, but we don't go there because we're trying to oppress people. We're there because people are calling 911 and they're asking for police services. And that's true. You know, uh, it's, it's, I think there are two things that are both true at once. One is that we live in a society that, that has criminalized all forms of, you know, ex all, all sorts of forms of extremely trivial misbehavior. Um, and we then tell the police to enforce the law, which means that police go into low income communities and they arrest people for ridiculously trivial offenses. Um, and those arrests virtually never make anybody better off, you know, not the putative victim, not the perpetrator, not the communities. Um, but police don't create those laws. Uh, we do, you know, through our elected representatives. You know, we have created a system in which we have radically over-criminalized various minor misdeeds, uh, and we have excessively long sentences. You know, we have a criminal justice system that is just horrible and that sends police out to arrest way too many people for way too many trivial things with, with terrible consequences for communities. But it is also true, you know, at the same time that violent crime is real. You know, it's not sort of a plot invented by the far right to justify police occupation of American cities. You know, people get 
robbed at gunpoint, they get carjacked, they get raped, they get stabbed, they get beaten up, they get murdered. And that's real and causes tremendous suffering too. And people call the police and for, ev- you know, for everyone, for every person you meet and you, you will meet lots of them who says, I don't want the police in my community, get them out of my community. They make me feel scared. They don't make me feel safe. You get another resident of the same community who says, no, I want more policing. You know, I, I want, we have a right to the protection of the police and I feel safer with a police car on my corner. You know, I think what those groups have in common is that, you know, everybody says, hey, we want policing that feels like protection and respectful protection, not that feels like a bunch of, you know, a new street gang, just this one wears uniforms that the state gives them. You know, we want better policing. We want fair policing. We want just policing. We want a better criminal justice system. But most people don't want no policing at all. Given the complexity and the nuance of all of this, as you've learned, as you're talking about, as you write about in the book, are we asking too much of essentially a self-selecting population that decides to become police officers? Oh, that's an interesting question, because I, I think there are a couple different pieces to that question. And, you know, one is, are we asking too much of police? And the answer to that, I think, is, is yes, we are. We want cops to be all these contradictory things at once, you know, warriors, protectors, mediators, social workers, medics. And it's really hard to do any one of those things well. And it's impossible to do all of them well. But we want cops, you know, we, we've structured our society in such a way that we're demanding that police do all of those things in a single shift. And, you know, no wonder they can't do it most of the time. Um, I think the other part of your question goes to, you know, right now it's sort of a self-selecting group. Um, I do believe very deeply that if you want to change policing, we also need to change who we recruit and who becomes police officers. You know, and and we should, and I, I always, <laughs> I sometimes drive my law students nuts when I say this, you know, I say, you're critical of the police, you know, go become a cop and figure out how to change the system from within. Because it, you know, we need to have outside agitators waving signs and saying, you know, defund the police. That's actually really important, that kind of external pressure. But we also need people to work to understand how police are trained, who understand the incentives they face on a really granular level, and who can change police culture from the inside. How difficult was it for you to, to gain trust and to gain acceptance from other police officers? You know, um, I, I none of us are as special as we think we are. <laughs> and I think I went into it thinking, oh, my goodness, you know, these, these police officers are going to be really suspicious of me because I'm a, a law professor and I'm a journalist and I'm older. And in fact, the vast majority of the cops I met, they didn't care. They didn't know, you know, no, very few people asked me um, much about my background and when they did, I would usually say something like, they'd say, oh, you're a reserve officer. You know, what do you do? The rest of the time, I'd say something boring, like I'm a lawyer, and then they would lose interest. Um, <laughs> or I'd say I teach, and they would assume I taught elementary school or something, and they would lose interest. So, you know, it's, it's basically, I think, to most of my partners, I was just another cop who, you know, depending on their point of view and where I was in my training cycle, in some cases, you know, somebody they had to show the ropes to or or somebody they, they could look at as an equal partner when I was further along. And most people weren't actually that curious, <laughs> um, which was also kind of humbling. <laughs> right. What's the most surprising or important thing you think you came away with from this experience? Uh, I think just, I don't know if this is surprising or it shouldn't be surprising, but just this really deep sense that, uh, in our society, we, we love these binary oppositions and sound bites. You know, it's either cops are underappreciated heroes or they're brutal racist thugs. And it just really very powerfully um, was borne in on me that the, the reality is much, much more complicated. You know, that there are there's a lot that is wrong with policing in America. And some of those things are things that police themselves can change. Right. We could change how we train and we should change how we train. We, we can change how police departments recruit and who they recruit. We can change how they operate. 
um, and that would help. That would make a difference. But at the same time, quite a lot of what is wrong with policing, as I said earlier, is is stuff that cops can't change because they're working in a system they didn't create. They're enforcing laws they didn't make in a social context. They often can't do much to change. And, you know, this is something I, I tell my law students all the time. You know, you don't like policing. Instead of complaining about cops, think about your own role as future lawyers. You know, you guys are going to be, you're, you know, some of you are going to run for city council or for Congress or whatever. Some of you are going to be prosecutors or judges or defense attorneys. All of you are going to be citizens uh, who have some responsibility to make your communities better. And if you don't like what people are arrested for by the police, you know, focus on getting rid of these stupid laws that turn minor misbehavior into crime. If you don't like how many how many traffic stops end with arrests or violence, why are we sending armed, uniformed people to enforce civil traffic law? You know, ima- I mean, what a bizarre thing when you actually stop and think about it, right? You know, imagine if we sent armed, uniformed cops to your door because you missed an IRS filing deadline, you know, or you or you, you know, violated some minor provision of your city's residential zoning code. We would think that was insane. Um, and yet we have decided that we need uniformed, armed people to stop your car when you make a red turn on right, when there's a sign that says no red on right. And surprise, um, a lot of those encounters don't go well, and people hate them. But we don't need to do that. You know, we as a society decided that that's how we want to handle this, and we don't have to do it that way. You know, I think, I think that those, those sort of two twin lessons, you know, it's complicated. Um, police can't change everything on their own. The rest of us need to look in the mirror, too. And we actually can choose to do this very, very differently, really, were driven home for me. Rosa Brooks, the book is Tangled Up in Blue, Policing the American City. Rosa, I thank you so much for spending time with us. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, Jeff. Thank you. And thank you for listening and for joining us here on Radio Who, What, Why. I hope you join us next week for another Radio Who, What, Why podcast. I'm Jeff Sheckman. If you like this podcast, please feel free to share and help others find it by rating and reviewing it on iTunes. You can also support this podcast and all the work we do by going to whowhatwhy.org forward slash donate.